All right, good morning. Today we are going to be talking about central processing units. Technical session number eight. As we've stated before, we do jump around on these a little bit because we're trying to marry them up with the other courses, make sure the information is running parallel so we all get what we need. And we're not trying to learn multiple things at one time. We're just kind of keeping it in pocket and trying to focus on all the same things at the same time. All right. For this particular technical session, we're going to be describing the various types of processors. So we already have started to touch on this and articulate how to select a processor to match system needs. Identify the CPU as the central processing unit and explain its purpose and requirements to keep it functioning. Don't let it overheat and don't forget your thermal paste. Choose the appropriate cooling method. There are a few we can go through. Name the steps to replacing and installing a processor. Identify common pitfalls when installing a processor. And given a set of symptoms, identify common problems with the CPU and describe how to solve them. All right. Now, for this particular technical session, we're going to be focusing on adaptability and growth mindset. Those two really do go hand in hand. Uh, where we have to understand that the information and skill sets that we have are not fixed. We have to be able to move um, and adapt to any new information we receive and attack problems from different angles based on that information. Um, if you are going down a particular path and you receive information that shows you that where you're headed is not the correct answer, you should be able to shift your perspective and move in another direction. And also understanding that our intelligence isn't fixed. You know, we are capable of learning through things, new things. If we weren't, we would not be here right now. So, types and char characteristics of processors. CPU itself is installed on the motherboard. It, it determines the system's computing power kind of like the brain of the computer for the most part. And as we talked about before, there are two major processing manufacturers, Intel and AMD, although there are some other new players. I believe Apple's trying to get into that arena now and make their own, but we'll see how that plays out. And each of these manufacturers have many different types and many different characteristics depending on the needs of the system you are using. <clears throat> so, Intel CPUs, they have desktop and laptops, and we need to know the basic names of the processors that they use. And the core, the brands that they use are the Pentium and the Celeron processors for the most part. They are very low power, thankfully portable, and um, their much smaller ones that they use in cell phones are called Atoms. So if you see Celeron, Pentium, Atom, Xenon, or Xeon, you should, and Centrino, you should know immediately they're talking about Intel. So these are their core, you know, umbrellas that they use for their processors. <clears throat> All right. Here is kind of the evolution of them through time. Uh, you know, Intel 4004, four bit processor, all the way back in 1971. The thing was probably the size of a dinner plate as well. Not quite sure though. Let's look up a picture on one. And, you know, all the way up to uh, the i3, i5, and i7s in, two, in 2009, which are about 64 bit. Do we need to memorize all these? No, it's just kind of background information to kind of give you an idea as to how it has evolved over time. Uh, does anybody know what this one is? I think this is like one of the first. Um, uh, processors that they ever use for any kind of server. This thing is probably about six inches by six inches. Uh, it used to be put into big servers and it represented a single bit. So it could either be on or off. It was one of the earliest processors. Um, Adam Savage, if you ever watched Mythbusters, 
he moved over to a new group called Tested, um, and they actually talked about this processor. It was kind of neat. If you are interested in the history of it, you look it up. It's pretty good. All right, AMD, short for Advanced Micro Devices. These tend to be very popular in the gaming communities because they are less expensive than Intel. And you do get comparable um, power or comparable processing power out of them. And uh, they use different sockets than Intel. So the motherboard must be designed specifically for AMD as we talked about that, the LGA versus the PGA, uh, but we will getting a little bit more into that as we move along. Um, current ADM or AMD families are the FX, the Phenom, Athlon, Sempron for desktops, and then they have the Athlon, Turion, V-Series, Phenom, and Sempron for laptops. All right, one second, sorry. All right. So here's kind of a breakdown of the CPUs. Uh, you have the gaming se segment, which is the Athlon uh, TX. You have the X2 for digital media. Mainstream segment is the normal Athlon and you get the Sempron, which I believe is your economy segment. Now, I believe it was AMD that did this and it wasn't too long ago because it's not cheap setting up um, manufacturing lines for, mi for microchips and CPUs. It's not cheap. So somebody there came up with a brilliant idea. What they were going to do is, is they were going to have these chips and they usually have their economy, their mid-tier and their high-end gaming. And so instead of creating three production lines, they decided to create just one. And then what they would do is put the instructions in the chip later that basically said, if the person only paid X amount, then they only get the economy. So it would throttle it. And then... You know, if they got the, the mid tier, then it would let up a little bit more. Then if you get the gaming, it would let up even more. Uh, well, the internet sleuths were pretty quick to figure this one out and realize that you could buy the cheap economy version and then overclock the CPU and get full uh, usage out of it. So on that particular um, run for chips, they took a huge bath because nobody was buying the gaming uh, the high-end version, everybody was buying the cheap economy version. So the next iteration of chips that came out, they went back to three to four production lines rather than a single line. All right. All right, this was my previous partner uh, where he did an upgrade on his CPU. Uh, show off that he, you know, what he had, he had the, at the, you know, the AMD Athlon 64 bit processor, dual core, and we'll get into a little bit more about what that means and the 2.3 gigahertz. Um, so you can actually look up the specs. If you're in windows, you can go to control panel, all control panel items and system, and it will give you a breakdown and tell you exactly which chip you have running in your system currently. All right, so this one should look a little familiar. This is a similar map to what we had yesterday. Shows you kind of the CPU is kind of the central brain of the system. And then you go out through the North Bridge where you have your memory slots and your graphics cards, your PCIe slots. And then you go down to your South Bridge where things move a little bit slower and you can have your old PCI slots, um, your input output devices, your flash ROM, all that other stuff. Here is a basic look inside of a CPU. So you have your input output unit, your control unit, which is kind of like the traffic cop. <clears throat> you have your AOUs which are your logic units. Those are your ones that are actually doing the computational power. You have the internal memory cache, which is kind of similar to your internet cache. If you're not familiar with that is essentially, every time you go out to an internet to load up a website, 
you're not always loading it up. Generally, the first time you go to it, that's why it takes longer because it has to download and process all that information. And then it will store a cache memory, like it'll store the majority of that data on your computer. So the next time you go there, say 95% of the information is the same, it'll use that information to load up quickly and then just download that little bit extra. So it holds on to essentially a cache memory. So it's things that you use repeatedly, it'll hold on to that information so it can be accessed faster. And that's what this internal cache memory is. And actually inside a CPU, there are three different levels of cache memory, which we're gonna be getting into here in a little bit. So you have three different types of cache memory. All right. There we go. Basic components, input, output, manages the data and instructions, entering and leaving the processor. So that's everything that's talking to outside the processor is managed through the IO unit. The control unit, kind of like the traffic cop, manages all activities inside the processor, tells you where all that information needs to be going. So you have the ALUs, which are your algorithmic logic units. That's what's performing all the computations uh, needed to run the computer at any given time. And then you have the registers, which are small holders, small holding areas for stuff that it needs to be processed. So um, it's just waiting to be processed at that time. <clears throat> and then you have the internal mash or internal memory cache, which holds data instructions that are used repeatedly or just waiting for the ALU to work on them. And then the buses are the little copper lines, kind of like streets in a city. They connect everything together. So we can go back and you look at it again. This is essentially how it is laid out. All right. Now, some things you need to keep in mind when selecting a CPU. Now, like we talked about yesterday, if you want to be very sure whether or not that, that CPU, your motherboard can handle that CPU, refer to the documentation. It should tell you whether or not your system is capable. Now, the speed at which the processor is operating inside is measured in gigahertz. And that will also kind of let you know what clock speed the processor itself supports. And remember, the clock speed is set by that um, crystal on the motherboard, the quartz crystal. Now, restrictions on the motherboard, obviously the architecture, how is it? Um, is it a 32-bit versus a 64-bit or can it do both? So that particular architecture may determine what type of motherboard you are able to use, uh, the memory cache inside of it. Also the socket chipset, you know, is it, you know, you can't put an Intel chip into an AMD socket. It just won't match up. Then you have multi-processing abilities, dual processors, multi-core processing, which is essentially is like multiple CPUs inside of a main chip, um, which allows for something called multi-threading, which basically means it can multitask, it can handle more than one um, set of instructions at any given time. And so if you have multiple cores and multi-threading, so multiple cores mean you have like two processors inside of that main chip. So it can set, handle two sets of instructions at any given time because you have the two processors. Multi-threading now allows each processor to handle two sets of instructions at any given time. So in a dual core processor, with multi-threading, it can now handle four sets of instructions at any given time. And interestingly, if you go and look at your uh, CPUs, it will actually look to your computer like there are four cores, even though there are actually only two. So it's kind of a weird trick that happens where it's a dual core processor. So you have two processors, two cores, and then your computer will recognize as if you're having four because of the multi-threading allowing it to handle double the amount of instructions at any given time. Now, multi-core processing 
and multi-threading comes in very handy if you're going to be creating virtual machines, which we, you know, we'll mess around with here a little bit later. Um, you can have uh, essentially create multiple machines on your system to work at any given time. You know, you could have some running Windows 7, some running Linux, all that kind of stuff. And that is kind of how um, a lot of hypervisor servers work, where you're running an operating system off of a server rather than on your computer. It is thankful, you know, thankfully because of virtualization and running these virtual machines that make this possible. So the CPU itself must be capable of virtualization in order for you to be able to actually do this. Uh, many of them have integrated graphics, so you get the basic graphics uh, when you first turn on your machine, all nice and wonderful. Although if you're going to get into um, graphic design, um, video editing, gaming, any of that kind of stuff, you're probably going to want to upgrade that to a graphics processing unit rather than operate just off of the graphics for the CPU itself. All right. Questions so far? Yes, DW. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, with the with the cores, right? So, so uh, dual cores. Let's say I have a a, a, a dual core processor that mm -hmm. allows multi-threading. Then the computer actually sees it as four cores, and I can have four simultaneous tasks running. Yes. So, and then it and basically it's the same as many cores as you have, as long as you have multi the multi threading, you multiply that by two. So if you have six, Correct. you could run twelve. Yes. And then I was reading on the in the book that multi threading is actually an Intel thing. Do AMD processors also run do this? In recent history, they have got this, and we we will actually get that out on the next slide. Uh, okay. I believe you know their version is called hyper threading. Yeah. Okay. But they have a their their chips can now do this this same operation. They weren't initially able to do that, but they finally developed the technology themselves. So Intel tends to be more expensive, but has a few more bells and whistles. But AMD is right on their heels with developing the technology, for the most part. But they are significantly cheaper. All right. Clock speed. We talked about this when we were talking about yesterday with motherboards determines the speed at which the CPU chipset and RAM can operate. <clears throat> the CPU's clock speed is the maximum speed that it can run at, not the speed at which it must run. So a CPU can run at any speed as long as it doesn't expand exceed its maximum clock speed. <clears throat> All modern CPUs run at some multiple of these system clock speed at any given time. Um, it's very rare that you'll actually get a motherboard that could technically exceed the speed of the CPU. Not to say it doesn't happen. Now, the CPU speed and the multiplier are set automatically by the motherboard itself. Once it's attached, they start communicating, then they establish the speed at which they can operate. You can manually adjust these things, typically not recommended. All right. So you have two main architectures that you will come across, which is the 32-bit and the 64-bit processors. The 64-bit um, processors are known as X64 for the 64 bits, and it can handle 64-bit um, operating systems, and um, it can only handle 32-bit ones in simulators. So it can simulate a 32 and run it that way. Like if you look at some of the more I think Windows 7, Windows 8, 8.1 uh, had a way for you to be able to run it in XP mode because a lot of companies loved XP and refused to upgrade. And so, you know, because they would have to rewrite a lot of their programs in order to get them to work on 7, 8, 8.1. So what they did was they allowed a way to virtually run XP mode so that you can run those applications on the current systems. So then they were more willing to upgrade to the modern systems because they didn't have to rewrite their older programs. 
because the base architecture of XP, which I think was on a Unix platform, was a little bit different than they used for eight, 7, 8, and 8.1. I think 11 is going back to the Unix architecture. All right, they also have hybrid, or excuse me, 32-bit processors are known as x86. I do not know why they do that. It may have been that the 32-bit processor came out in 1986, and that is why they call it that. But they're referred to as x86. So basically know that 64 and x64 are the same. x86 goes with 32. And then the hybrid processors are known as x86 slash 64s, and they can handle 32 or 64. And AMD produced the first one of those. All right, multi-threading. So we kind of just talked about this. Each processor or core itself processes two threads or two tasks at the same time. So it makes a single CPU act like two. Like we were just talking about, if you go in and you look at your cores, if you have a four core processor, which is pretty common right now, and you go and you look at your cores, it'll show eight. <clears throat> Intel calls its technology hyper-threading, and then AMD, like I think, yeah, it says 2017, is when they started using true multiprocessing. All right. All right. So multi core is a combination of multiple CPUs in a single chip or package uh, to increase the processing power. This is kind of how they were able to. Um, go around Moore's law. Um, if you're, is anybody familiar here with Moore's law? I think I mentioned it already. It's uh, every 18 months, technology gets twice as fast and half as expensive and gets smaller. So in order to uh, continue that trajectory, which has been going on, I think since the 60s, every 18 months, we've doubled the speed of processors and have their cost. Um, in order to continue on that trajectory, we started adding multiple cores within a single uh, CPU or in a single chipset in order to continue that doubling of technology and trajectory. So, so multi-core processors are far more common today than they were, you know, six, seven years ago. And now it's, it is, the most common chipsets you'll have are multi cores. So, ah, now we're going to talk about it. All right. So, now we're going to talk about cache memory. Remember, we talked about the, the internet cache where it's kind of storing things until you need it again. Um, so, you may, it may even be for just a few minutes. Like, you know, I've downloaded the Google homepage. Okay. Hold this for a second. You know, while I download my results and then I can take back the information you've given me, apply it to the results. And then I get the full web page. So inside of a, like say a quad core processor right here, there's actually three different levels of cache memory. And we do need to know all of them. Let me get my annotator right here. So first you have your, what's called the L1 cache. The L1 cache is far, by far the most expensive, hands down the fastest, and it's also gonna be the smallest amount you have. And each CPU has its own L1 cache, and it is located inside the CPU itself. Terrible writing, L1, L1. So each CPU has its own L1 cache, most expensive, the smallest, but hands down the fastest because it's fully integrated into the CPU. Now, each CPU also has its own L2 or level two cache. It's not as fast, it's not quite as expensive, 
but every single CPU has its own L2. And it's located just outside each one. So it's still geographically close, allowing for pretty quick speed. It's a little more expensive or a little less expensive than the L1. Still pretty expensive. You get a little more of it. And so in this quad core, we get four L2s. And then finally, we have our L3 cache, which is larger than the other two. Still inside the chipset, <clears throat> but it is shared by all CPUs. It is the least expensive of the three, the largest amount of data can be stored there and it is the least expensive of the three. So L1 on each chip, fastest, most expensive. Put little dollar signs there. There you go. So fastest, most expensive L2s just outside the CPUs, a little bit larger, a little bit less expensive. And then you have the L3s, by far the largest and least expensive of the three, but shared by all CPUs, all cores. <clears throat> Any questions with regards to this? Yes, Darwin. So if, so that's a, for core four, let's say it was a, like a, a core two, would it then be uh, two L2s, two L1s and one L3 making it five total cases? Okay, can you repeat that one more time? All right, so you, uh, so right now you showed, uh, for four cores, right? For a CPU yes. with four cores, All right? So the total number of cases actually is nine, right? Because you got four L1s, four L2s, and one L3 that's shared by all of them, right? Yes. So in a, in like, uh, if it was a, like a, a two core processor, if there were two mm -hmm. cores, would it then be five? Because it would be two L1s, two mm -hmm. L2s, and one L3? Yes, absolutely. So, so it would be, Times two plus one for the amount. Essentially, of essentially. Okay, cool. But they they distinguish, especially in the A plus, they distinguish between the three different levels of cache. So they're not going to say how many cache memories do you have in the chip. They're going to say, you know, they're going to be asking you like the difference between an L one versus an L three. You know, which one would be the least expensive? And no, you can't upgrade these after the fact because these are inside the actual processor. So. You cannot upgrade these after the fact. So what you get when you buy it, that's what you got. Yes, Vincata. You said uh, L3 Apache is shared, uh, is cap has capacity of storing large data. I'm sorry, the L3 what? Sorry, I'm having a hard time here today, I'm sorry. Um, you said it is larger than L, uh, L1, L2. Yes. And it is a little bit lesser expensive than L1, L2. Correct. And it is also shared by all four CPUs. Correct. Absolutely. So it is It is larger in, like in, in size. It can handle more volume. It is less expensive because it doesn't have to be input directly onto this, you know, the processor. Um, and, but... It is shared by all the cores in the processor itself or in the. Uh, what do you um, mean by handling yeah. more volume? Well, so like instead of like think about it like in terms of water, uh, the L1 cache may only be able to handle a cup of water. So just a little bit of water. <clears throat> the L2 may, may be able to handle, say, you know, a quart or a pint. And then the L3 would be able to handle a gallon. Which is like data, data you understand. Yes, but... correct. So it's the amount of data it can handle at any given time. Thank you. No problem. Cynthia. Um, good morning. In regards to the Moore's law, um, since uh, mo the most modern core processors are the quad core, so um, in regards to Moore's law, then would the other one be like double that with like an octo core? 
with, oh, with like the eight cores. Yeah. With that I mean, you, I guess you could call it that. I mean, because you know, they call it a quad core, so an octa core would make sense. Oh, okay, cool. I just, I just wondered. Wow, that's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. And this, I mean, and, and this is kind of how they're getting around it. But um, what's really cool if you start paying attention to like organic computing, um, and um, gosh, I'm trying to, I'll, I'll think of it here in a minute. I'll explain it. There's some really cool stuff going on. Uh, where it's actually going to be changing away from binary to where instead of having on and off, we may have on, off, and partway on um, quantum computing. So that's the way that works. Instead of having you know a binary on or off, they have on, off, or partway on, which allows essentially for a trinary programming system, which can massively condense programs and run significantly faster. So there's a lot of really cool stuff happening there, um, but they're trying to get it to where it's not cost prohibitive for companies to start utilizing it, but that's just going to take a little bit of time and um, more people kind of jumping on that bandwagon. So, all right. Any questions on this so far? The next slide kind of breaks it down each one, but I like to show it visually before we get into the definitional portion of it. So, and if you remember yesterday, we were talking about heat sinks. What does that look like right there? So there is a heat sink right there that is inside the chip. So they do utilize these things everywhere. And this thing is tiny. But you can see all the little spikes on it, you know, for the little, you know, aluminum blades to help disperse the heat, all that stuff. But that is a heat sink right there inside the chip itself. All right. So here it kind of breaks it down. Um, each level of cache, you have your L1, smaller, very short access time, splits into L1D um, and L1I for instructions. Very expensive, very small amount of space it actually has on top of each processor, two, bigger capacity than L1, and a little bit longer access time because it's sitting outside the processor itself. L3 shared by all of them, but has the largest um, memory available. So, all right. So most current CPUs have an integrated memory controller, IMC, included in the processor package, and it enables faster control over things like the, the L3 cache, so it can kind of share that burden among the different processors you have so that there isn't a, you know, a fight for bandwidth, essentially. <clears throat> it will prioritize the information coming in and allows the system to perform much more efficiently because of this. It's almost like quality of service with regards to internet access, which we will talk about a little bit later, but basically quality of service is you can prioritize different types of data streams. Like you can say, like we're on Zoom, so you want you know video calling to be the highest priority so that that runs smoothly. So that will get priority over everything else. Email, not so um, critical. So it can be delayed a little bit and not affect the overall performance. So you would prioritize different types of data, quality of service. That's kind of what they're doing here with the integrated memory controller, where it's prioritizing different tasks so that the most important ones get taken care of first to make the system run significantly more efficiently. All right, questions so far? How I memorized the, the levels of the cache memory was I literally drew out that diagram I just showed you a couple times while just kind of vocalizing what each one did. So I just drew out that little diagram real quick, took me about 20, 30 seconds and it just helped me remember it. So that was a tip that I used when I was going through the program. All right. <clears throat> Here's a different way of looking at it, um, where it shows the various cores with their caches and then the shared L3 cache as well. It's a good one to take a quick screenshot. 
um, if you find it helpful. Um, otherwise, we'll have the student pace version in the Slack channel after this. So you can go back and look at it if you wish. I'll give you a couple seconds here for a screenshot. All right, and let's go. All right, security. So inside the CPU, they have the EDB or execute disable bit. It's a security built itself onto the processor, referred to as XD in Intel and NX in AMD processors. You will see that come up uh, when you're talking about, I think it's like Windows, eight requires that it have either xd or nx um, on the chip for it to actually be able to function so this does come up with regards to um operating system requirements i do i do believe once they got up to windows 10 they didn't require it anymore but i do believe 8 and 8.1 did require it all right it can work with your operating system to designate an area of memory for holding data or instructions, if you so choose. And when an area is designated for data, instructions stored in this area are not executed. It is strictly holding it as data, thus preventing a buffer overflow attack by malicious software, which attempts to run its code from an area of memory assigned to another program. <clears throat> So in terms of like buffer overflow, what that kind of means is they keep, they're trying to overwhelm a system by giving it too much to do. Because if you give a CPU or a, a computer too much to do, it, it essentially just crashes because it can't handle that amount of processing. Um, so there was one, it's like a Synac attack where it's asking, when you communicate when you connect to another computer you have to ask to connect to that computer basically says like hey i want to talk and the other computer goes okay we can talk and then you could say okay let's begin the conversation and then you start what they may do is they say hey i want to talk and then the computer goes okay let's talk and then they just wait and then they then they initiate another request and then another request and then another request and another request so it's continually asking hey i want to talk but never responding after that there's a waiting period after it says, okay, let's talk, and it waits for a response. And if you do that enough times, you chew up all the memory in the computer, and then it eventually just crashes the computer. And that's considered essentially like a buffer overflow. All right. So you have to have the compatible operating system like we were talking about. Uh, Windows 8, 8.1 do require it. So that would be a compatible operating system for it. And it can be enabled in the BIOS or the UEFI, uh, depending on if you're using a 64-bit or 32-bit. And even though the EDB can stop some malware from executing, it cannot remove it. So you still need to utilize anti-malware programs in order to take care of that. All right, virtualization. We will get into this a little bit more later. Um, a computer can use software essentially to, oh, somebody have a question? No, okay. So um, essentially a computer can use software to create and manage multiple virtual machines. So you could literally have multiple different operating systems running on top of your current ones. So like if you're running Windows 10, you can have a virtual machine running Windows 7. You could have a virtual machine running Linux. You know, you could have, you know, all of these open at the same time, so long as you have enough RAM memory or excuse me, RAM storage and cores to be able to run it. So you can run an operating system off of essentially each individual core. So when you start seeing like really high core counts on chips. That is typically because they're going to be used for uh, virtual machines. So somebody can set them up as a hypervisor and you can actually rent out space on a computer, letting other people run operating systems off of your machine rather than their own. All right, 
integrated graphics. So most CPUs will have an integrated GPU or graphics processing unit integrated inside of it so that it can uh, manipulate the graphic data to form the images that we see on our screens. Now, you might actually have a graphics video card itself, which would be an upgraded version of this. Um, some chipsets do not have integrated graphics because the intention would be that you would automatically have a graphics card um, that you're going to be relying upon. <clears throat> now, it might be embedded in the CPU package. When it's inside the CPU, it's called integrated graphics. So there is that. <clears throat> so most of them, second generation or higher, have this already built into the chipsets. And that is if you have not upgraded your graphics or graphics card and you're just using the standard of what came with your computer, that is the integrated graphics you're using. All right. Pin grid array versus LAN grid array. This gives you a better picture of it than what we were looking at earlier because it gives you kind of a nice side by side. So we got the LAN grid array right here, which is who? Who does LAN grid array? Flat chips? Intel. 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 So it's flat like a land, so land grid array. And then you have the pin grid array where you can see all these nice little pins sticking up. You remember me telling you the story about our the TA in my class dropping it and it just hit on the edge of all these pins and bent a whole bunch of them. So these are very, very sensitive to things like that. So this would be a pin grid array or PGA and they all fit into sockets like this that will have a locking mechanism that will hold them down and then this little goop right here this is not glue this is thermal paste one of the most important things when installing your cpu because it allows for the uh, heat to transfer in a evenly distributed manner so that the cpu itself can cool down like we were talking about earlier the cpu can go from room temperature to like i think it's close to 500 degrees in less than two seconds. Like it heats up that fast. It is really quick. <clears throat> Here are a variety of Intel sockets and um, how they will be used. So the big thing, LGA, land grid array. So LGA, LAN grid array. All your LGA labeled sockets, you don't need to memorize all of this, but understand when you see LGA, that's an Intel chip or Intel socket, excuse me. So each one of them start with the LGA. I think there's the FC LGA is the only one that is a little different, but almost all of them start with LGA. You do not need to memorize this, but understand the naming structure. Typically, the number after it right here, this 1155, that's the number of pins in that particular chip. So that would be a way for you to quickly distinguish that is that, you know, that motherboard, if you're looking through the directions, it has an LGA. We know that is a Intel chipset, land grid array. So here's a basic look at the LGAs, you can see all these little pins sticking up. They don't have the sockets like the AMD. So each one of them, you can see them all sticking up. Typically, when they ask about a socket, um, the old A plus prior to the most recent iteration, actually, you had to memorize these charts. <clears throat> you may get one question with regards to a chip versus a socket. You know, which socket does this chip go with? And if you know the naming structure, so you know the LGA goes with Intel, if it's an Intel chip, it'll get you down to 50-50. So if you know the naming structure, it'll get you down to 50-50, and then you, you got a pretty edu educated guess at that point, and it's a single question if you get it. So, yes, Jessica. Uh, 
I'm not really seeing the pins you're referring to for the LGA. Could you kind of point that out? Because this, uh, the Intel sockets I'm looking at right now, they kind of, I am still trying to better recognize photos. So when you say yeah. pins, I'm not seeing it. The last slide you had, I could visibly see it. Um, the pins going, uh, coming up. I'm sorry, the previous one before this one. So here, yeah. that's the AMD chip. So this is the chip itself and it has the pin sticking up and that's gonna go down into a socket. And kind of a quick way to get it because I know the pictures aren't necessarily super, super clear. Um, the sockets that the chip will lay down into will typically be either black or white with pinholes in it. Now, and that would be for the AMD chip. For the Intel chip, the pins are gonna be sticking up out of it. <clears throat> and I know it's hard to see but they have a more metallic look. So you're seeing the actual pins. Okay. So if you see like it has a more metallic look, yeah. then you can see like all of these have kind of like that copperish gold appearance to them. So that'll tell you that there's pins sticking up. Gotcha. And, and you're typically not going to be looking at pictures. Like they're not going to show you a picture of it on the exam and say what chip goes with this. They're going to ask you based off of the naming of it. So they're going to give you an LGA 1155 what socket does that go with or what chip does that go with? Um, so that's kind of how to see And But in real life, you'll be able to easily see whether it's pins or holes. Okay, thank you. Good question though. All right, so AMD sockets. <clears throat> they will either start with AM or FM. So think of it like a radio, AMD, AM, FM. So AM and FM go together. You know, but they'll have the AM3 or the FMs. So AM, FM. And that'll let you know which sockets you're associating them with. So, questions so far? All right. And here's kind of what we're talking about. If you look at it right here, Jessica, see it's got that cream, white, or black color, and you can see all the little holes. Does it make it a little bit clearer when you're looking at it? You can see like little tiny pinholes. <clears throat> it's either that black, white, or cream color. And then we go back here, and it has more of a metallic look because of the pins. All right. So most of your issues with regards to CPUs come from managing heat. So a lot of it comes down to your heat sink. Uh, keeping the thermal paste active because if it's older, like if it, you know, it's been a, like a couple of years, that thermal paste may dry up, start to crack, and then not efficiently uh, transfer the heat to the CPU will start overheating at that time, which is why every couple of years, if you're opening up, it's worth removing that heat sink, taking a look at the thermal paste real quick, just seeing if it's still kind of moist. Uh, and so it will continue to function. Um, other things people do is when they're applying uh, thermal paste to it, they, uh, they go a little bit overboard. And if you look down here, you can see here's the chipset. There's where the heat sink was supposed to be. And they put a ton of thermo paste on this. It was like just smushing out over the sides. And that's bad. Because uh, that may affect your chip's ability to work. And we don't want to do that. If, if this ever happens, you quite literally have to take it off, clean everything off reapply and then put it back on. All you need is about the size of a P or a pencil eraser. That's about, about all you need. Although thankfully, most heat sinks, when you buy them, if you're putting one together new, already has the thermal paste applied to the back of the heat sink. You just remove like a thin plastic film, stick it down on the, on the CPU and you're ready to roll. So.
I wouldn't say it is available at any hardware store, but computer stores, you know, will have them. You can order them online pretty inexpensively. Most times, if you order a CPU or a, or a uh, heat sink, it will come with it. So, yeah, quarter size would probably be too much. <clears throat> All right. So, as you see on top of the CPU here, it not only has a heat sink sitting on it, but it has a fan sitting on top of the heat sink, forcing air down through that heat sink to disperse that heat away from there as quickly as possible. If there was only a heat sink on there, we would call that passive cooling, where just the natural airflow coming through this, the computer would disperse enough of the heat to where the chipset wouldn't overheat itself. CPU does not work that way. It requires more active cooling. So the lowest level of active cooling you can install is the uh, heat sink with the um, CPU fan sitting directly on top of it. <clears throat> All right. So here we go. You can see it again here. Here is passive cooling where you just have the straight heat sink sit, you know, that you would just put on top of a chipset. Um, this would be something you would typically see like on a North Bridge and it would allow for the dispersal of the heat that way. Doesn't require any extra effort. And for lower level chips, that may be sufficient for the CPU. You have the CPU on the bottom, thermal paste, then the heat sink, then the fan on top of it. And then you have case fans on the front and back of your computer that move air completely through the computer, um, trying to keep it at a decent temperature, keep it cool enough. So it'll generally draw in from the front and expel heat out the back. Yes, the one with the fan on it, this is active cooling, this is passive cooling. So passive means nothing else is happening. You just literally have it there, it draws the heat away and that's good enough. All right, let me get into liquid cooling. So if anybody's ever built a gaming PC, which I think a few of you out there have, uh, you may go for the uh, more robust cooling system, which is liquid cooling. It operates much like the radiator on your car. Um, you have a plate um, that water is kind of moved through and you have a radiator that the water gets pumped into and around and disperses the heat that way. So liquid cooling, uh, it is far more efficient than the actual um, cake, like the fan with the um, heat sink on top of it. However, the problem with the liquid coolings is, it's, you know, when they break, you tend to not know until it's too late. With a fan, you can hear and know when they're not working. Liquid cooling, not so much. So you do have to pay a little bit more attention to it. Um, but if you go online, like YouTube or whatever, and you look at some of the cool computer builds that they do, a lot of them have liquid cooling. And they'll do like multicolored uh, liquids through them. It's kind of neat. Like I said, some people are viewing them more like art pieces rather than just computers. So they'll display them with the clear casings on the side, have the LEDs in there, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. So they're doing a lot of really neat with it, things with it. Then you actually have submersible systems right here, which is basically it looks like a computer inside of a fish tank. So they got uh, the whole thing itself is completely immersed in liquid, which is a mineral oil. Um, of all the methods there are to keep a system cool, this one absolutely is the most effective because it is completely surrounded by a cooling system. And, um, but it is the most expensive to maintain because you can't allow a lot of debris to get in there. Um, you have to change the oil out regularly. It's not very cheap to set up, but it does kind of look cool if you have like a fish tank with your computer in it on your desk, you know, let's be honest. So, you know, people tend to look at that like, no way, that's real. Like, yeah, they absolutely have these a lot of, a lot of places. So main ways you can do cooling, you have the fan and heat sink, you have liquid cooling, and you have submersive systems. <clears throat> All right. Why don't we go ahead and take our break now before we jump into um, removing and installing a CPU. 
So we can go ahead and take a quick break, take 10 minutes, come back at 10.30 local time. And we will continue. We'll go ahead and pause the recording. Okay, so now we're going to go over the steps to removing and installing a CPU. A lot of these are very similar to um, the first few steps are always about the same. Um, steps may you know, vary depending on the motherboard architecture you have. So following the documentation specified steps is always the best to go to, but in general, the steps remain pretty much the same. So the new processor, I know it's tempting to go in there and pull the processor out and look how pretty it is and you know, give it a nice once over like, yeah, that's where that paycheck went. But we wanna keep it in, that, in the packaging until the very last minute, just to minimize any possibility of it getting damaged. So obviously we're backing up our data, we're planning and organizing our work, we're tying back our long hair, removing loose jewelry, all that fun stuff. You know, we're assuming all that's been done at this point. Now we're gonna power down the system, press and hold that power button for three to five seconds to disperse any residual charge, unplug the computer, uh, so that we can work safely. At that point, we can remove the side panel access uh, to the PC, hook up our ESD safety strap, if we have the strap or the ESD mat, whatever precautions we're using, or even the gloves, if you so prefer. Um, at that point, we would go and remove the uh, case fan or heat sink from the top and usually it's being held on by clips or screws. If it's held on by screws, please remember to remove it using the X method. So if you do one screw, then you move to the caddy corner screw, undo that one, then you move down and then you X over again. And you'll do that in reverse when you reapply. So after that, you should be able to remove the heat sink, placing it on an ESD bag. <clears throat> or an anti-static bag. Take notice of the thermal paste condition. Is it dried and cracked? Is the person who was there before you, did they not put enough? Did they put too much? Um, if it does not look to be in good condition, carefully clean it off, wipe it off the heat sink. You don't necessarily need to worry about it on the CPU unless you're reusing it, because uh, you're gonna be removing that one from this system. After that, most CPUs have an arm right here, this little latch that you can undo and then a little door will flip up to release the CPU itself. And you generally open that up by gently pushing down on that little arm, pulling it out, and then the whole system opens up so that you can easily remove the CPU using a chip extractor. And remember in this particular instance, almost no force is needed. Generally the weight of the CPU itself is enough. And if you're, if it, you're having to pull on that sucker with any re you know, reasonable amount of force to get it out, something's wrong. So stop, examine it a little better, see if you can find out if it's snagged on anything because you don't want to damage anything inside the socket. And trust me when I tell you, if it was like an AMD, it's no fun having to use little tweezers to fish the pins out of the sockets. All right. So you grip it only by the edges, but if, you know, again, we recommend using the chip extractor because that is the safest, most secure way to be able to do that. Um, so you do that very gently and then you store it inside the ESD bag. Um, you could set it there temporarily until you remove the new CPU from its packaging and you can put the old one in that packaging if you wish to save it for later and then just remark what it is. So at this point, 
Now that we've set the old chip aside, we can pull out the new chip from its bag, being very careful to hold by the edges using a chip extractor. Look carefully at the socket. So right here, there's a little yellow triangle. It's hard to see. So there's a little yellow triangle. And then on the motherboard, there is a little yellow triangle. You want to match these up. Thankfully, most of them have notches cut into them. So there's only one way they can go in. Some don't. So in that case, we want to look for that little tiny yellow triangle. And, and um, does anybody remember what that little yellow or red triangle means? It means pin one. Correct. It is closest to pin one. So you want to match up that triangle with the one on the board, and then it should set inside there with very little effort. I need to go back here for Candido for one second. Let me know when you are ready, sir. Hey, Mark, for notes purposes, is yellow triangle sufficient for equals pin one? It's the spot the on, on whatever. A... Do I'm sorry. Go ahead, Can you say that again? No, go ahead, Mark. You're, you're fine. Repeat your question, Jessica. I just, for my notes, um, the small triangle, that comment, because I want to make sure I have it this time, because I see I missed it the first round. Um, it meaning pin one. Does the yellow triangle go by any other name? <laughs> Does it have like an actual name name or yellow triangle no. should be good? Uh, no, there's no other no alternate name for it. Yeah, they may they it may just ask you so like simple. You know, I, it just sounds so simple. <laughs> there are there are instances where you know you'll be asked a question, the answer will be so simple. You're like, nah, it's not that easy. So you actually talk yourself out of the answer because it seems too easy. Oh yeah, I I have a feeling we'll have some of those. Okay, awesome. Thanks, guys. Not a problem. So yeah, it's just yellow triangle. They may ask you what the yellow triangle means. And when they're asking that, it means it's the, the section on, you know, whatever it is you're hooking up, that is the closest point to pin one. So. <clears throat> you good, Ken, you know, you can just give me a thumbs up. So, okay, yellow triangle, pin one. They have it on the board, they have it on the chip. And they have it on some of the plugs too. If the plug can be re is reversible, they will have a yellow triangle on there and on the board to tell you where pin one is. So it's rare to have the reversible plugs. All right, next, you're gonna lock down the arm on that CPU and close that door. Uh, they typically will call these ZIFs or zero insertion force. And that is what they use to actually secure the chip. It's this little metal gate that goes all the way around the chip itself. And then this metal arm here will lock it down in place and hold the chip securely in the board. Then you're gonna apply your thermal paste to the center of the chip. If it is not already handily applied to the um, heat sink you're gonna be using, so right here, they'll give you what looks like a little syringe without a needle. And you just plunk down about a pencil erasers worth of thermal paste on top of it. And then apply your uh, heat sink on top of it. Now, after you place the heat sink on top of the processor, you go ahead and secure the heat, heat sink down. And then if the fan and heat sink are two different pieces, then you would apply the fan on top of the heat sink itself. And then you would connect the power cord right here onto the board where it says CPU fan, which should be very, very close to where the CPU is located um, so that the computer can control the cooling mechanism. And then you replace the door on the side of your unit, turn it on and pray. Yes, Robert. 
What if you apply a little too much thermal paste? Then you probably, at that point, you have to remove the heat sink and clean off the excess. And hope it didn't get like underneath the chip and stuff like that. But usually that little gate will uh, prevent that from happening. But yeah, you want to remove the heat sink and clean up the excess thermal paste. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yes, clean. Really, you actually have to like hope that it works. <laughs> Anytime you take a computer apart and put it back together, you turn it on and pray, and it's like, oh, no, come on. Yeah, no, please, no post error. <laughs> no, taking it apart is one thing. I'm just saying, like, as far as the install of putting in a new PC, then you're like, okay, I think everything is in there. And yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's every time because you might have gotten a bad component. You know, it might, I mean, there, there could be any number of things as to why it doesn't work right. And so like, you're just sitting there going, okay, just please, everything goes smoothly. Okay. You know, you turn it on because you don't want to yank that sucker apart again. Because right. every time you do, you increase the probability that something breaks. Okay. So you, you want to do that as little as possible. All right. So is it safe, fair to say that any motherboard that you either, at least as far as installing goes, will label out what speed it can you know it can move through onto onto you know, like to whichever cpu you attach to it Is yeah it should have a bus speed um and clock speed notated within the uh documentation i think they may even have it uh notated on the board itself okay and then, <laughs> they have a ton of information on that board if you know where to look all right and then on the premise of the repair or any of it if need be to say just fix whatever's in there you should be able to find it on the UEFI or on the BIOS as far as the clock speed that it can help. Well, I mean, if it's already functioning, yeah, yeah. you're you're yeah, you should be able to in there. They should give you detailed specs if needed. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? All right. So at this point, we got a quick little video. Let me make sure I shared my sound before we get going on this. Hi there, this is Ranjit from tech2bus.com and in this video we're going to install Intel processor on this uh, motherboard and the motherboard that you're seeing is an OSIS motherboard based on the Intel Z77 chipset and this supports both the Sandy Bridge and the Ivy Bridge chips uh, based on the LGA socket 1155 and I'm going to use a LGA 1155 chip on the same and the general thing before attempting to do something like this is that you notice this is the motherboard and the thing that you have to keep in mind is uh, any static electricity that you might have built up should be uh, dissipated before even you touch the motherboard because it can uh, damage the motherboard so i suggest wearing a uh, anti uh, static wristband or grounding yourself before attempting to do the same and for this test let me move the motherboard i'm using a stock intel kit in which we get this uh, uh, CPU cooler and the chip itself and uh, if you take out the CPU cooler as you see the thermal paste is already pre-applied so I'm not going to apply the thermal paste here but if you're using an aftermarket air cooler or something like that you might need to apply the thermal paste on the chip and this is the actual motherboard uh, let me just zoom in a little bit because this is the area where we're going to work and the first thing you do is gently press this and move this and open this latch and this latch will open this way and now Kelly sorry to interrupt can you pause here right at this point processor that you have do notice I'm sorry I was trying I was looking at my motherboard as well trying to find the north and south bridge and now that he has it exposed like that, can you point out the North and South Bridge?
Also take note that the heat sink and the fan are the, are the same, are a single unit versus one and the other. They can come in either way. <clears throat> All right, on this one, this one likely the north bridge is integrated into the CPU. Otherwise, I would assume that this is it right here uh, because of its location. Uh, so I should be checking for the large heat sink. So it may be obstructed by the heat sink. So I mean, well, the heat sink is the indicator of where it is. Uh, so your largest chip set with a heat sink on top of it is likely your, if you have two sets of them, it's the North Bridge. Unless the North Bridge is integrated into the CPU, then the largest chip set you will see outside of your CPU will be your South Bridge. So on this one, I believe this would be the North Bridge. Um, maybe this is the South Bridge. But a lot of times in the documentation, it will also tell you <clears throat> this one is not necessarily as clear cut. <clears throat> so will I have to be like, uh, I'm using the, the labs. Well, I'm at any point, am I going to have to click on an image where it says, where is the South Bridge? Where is the North Bridge? bridge? And I'll have Yes, to but it will be pretty clearly point. defined. Okay. Like on the, um, the motherboard we showed you uh, on yesterday. Yes, we had everything mapped out. That that is where it would be. It'd, it'd be something is already already labeled and say, "What is this?" Got it. Okay. It won't be just a blank page where they go, "Where's the North Bridge?" So they'll already have things labeled, and then you'll have to determine what they are based off the labels. Got it. All right. So to a degree, you can use process of elimination. <clears throat> All right. And he's about to commit a big no-no and handle the chip by hand. And you should not touch this area. Gently lift it. And let me just move the motherboard. And let me show you one more thing that is uh, a little bit important. Let me see. Uh, yeah. If you notice here, you can see these two notches. And... On the socket of the motherboard also, you will have similar two notches. Let me break the motherboard now. And as you can see, here are the two notches. So, and we also have an arrow over here. And we have an arrow on this. So, you just gently place the chip and it should sit down. And now what you have to do is bring back this plate like this and depress the lever do note that you might have to apply a little bit of pressure that is okay now you have installed the chip now what you have to do is now we are going to install this fan on the same and to do that it's uh, also pretty easy let me show you the motherboard actually uh, let me just zoom out a little bit And if you notice, we have these four holes over here and our stock Intel cooler will mount there. And let me just zoom in a bit so you get a better view. And what we do is we gently place this, this over here, over the four holes approximately. And those four pins should just go down gently. And now what we do is hold on to the processor like this and just depress and you'll get a clicking sound and do the same for the next one and proceed with the others. You should get this clicking sound that you have heard. That means we have fixed the CPU cooler and now the last thing that we need to do is let me show you the same. We your motherboard should have a header like this known as the CPU fan and you now just need to attach the CPU fan and that's it and that's how you have installed your CPU on your motherboard and let me just uh, turn the motherboard one second.
And if you look at the back, I want to show these tiny pins. They should come out. That means you have successfully properly installed the stock Intel CPU cooler. So that. So now getting a better look at it, this likely has the North Bridge integrated. <clears throat> and I'm saying this is the South Bridge because here's where all your input outputs are. Got it. That makes sense. They should be next to the input outputs. I do remember that as yeah, well as yeah. the hard drive though, which is on the opposite side, but <laughs> all right. I get it. Yeah. But your, um, yeah, your hard drive is on the opposite side, but that would be my assumption based off this board. Every board's different. So sometimes you do need to look at the, um, schematic of it and it'll tell you where everything is. Go ahead, Glenn. So as far as cooling fans goes, thermal paste, even how he was able to insert the board, it does, I mean, you can actually buy specific fans that have the heat sink and the thermal paste pre-added onto it. Yeah, then, well, I mean, a lot of times when you buy heat sinks new, they'll have thermal paste already applied. So they already, have, oh, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And so all you have to do, there's like a little plastic film that you just got to make sure to remove that. And then, and then you apply the thermal paste. And then you just, you know, set the heat sink on it and you're good to go. Well, because I remember having to know that or having to, under, you know, like, I don't think that was available years ago. No. So, no. This is, okay. That is a relatively recent development. Oh, okay. Now, the second thing is that the motherboards, all the motherboards now have the, uh, for at least Intel motherboards have the, have the, I guess you could call it the mouse trap cage system that, uh, that it's set in or or no it's just that particular one just did um you know with the one with the arm clip to hold it down that's what I'm saying. oh no yeah that's called a ziff and so yeah a lot of them have like almost all of them have that oh so them the have. locking mechanism it's so that you don't apply too much force to it and it keeps the chip secure in place okay so, this is gonna be so that's pretty standard okay okay, okay. And that's for intel and amd i'm building my first computer now. <laughs> all right that works thank you mm -hmm. all right continuing on some pitfalls for installation um like your old pin grid array or amd is stuck in the socket too much force can cause some of the pins to break off inside the socket fortunately we talked about this um use balanced force to try to lift up the old processor and unfortunately if a pin breaks off um Use your use some very small tweezers uh, to pull the pins out, so you can clear the field before you put your new um, chip in. Thermal paste has fused the CPU and the heatsink. Unlatch or unscrew the heatsink from the board slowly and carefully, like do little twists to kind of dislodge it. The other one is use non-waxed, non-flavored dental floss, and you put it, you know, around the other, around the side of it, and then you just gently pull the dental floss through, and that will dislodge the heat sink and the CPU from each other. So that is probably one of the easier methods to do it. Dental floss is cheap. Keep a small roll of it in your bag. Help out quite a lot. Uh, it's not on the South Bridge, but it's close to it um, because the CMOS would be close to it. All right. Next, the, har the arm holding the LGA CPU socket won't latch. Um, Land grid array that you heard this guy, he mentioned it earlier. He said a ZIF, which means zero insertion force. Um, so if the arm won't go back down, be sure that the chip itself is seated correctly before continuing to try again. Uh, if, the zip, if the ZIF does not apply the arm, though, only the CPU uh, fitting into the socket. So if you push it down, it can take a lot of effort just if you're doing it on the arm. But again, if that door does not go down properly or easily, Open it back up, just double check, make sure the chip is sitting in there properly. If it's off by like one degree, it may not be sitting properly enough 
for the ZIF to latch down properly. So worth going in there, maybe taking it out, resetting it, just make sure it's good, close the latch and then try the arm again. But the arm itself may take a little bit of effort to get that sucker lock, uh, locked properly. All right, questions so far? All right. So thankfully, CPUs rarely have mechanical problems. And typically, if there are, it's a manufacturer default, and it typically is catastrophic, which means replace the whole thing. There's never a case where you're going to be opening up a CPU to try to do a repair as technologically advanced as we may think we are. We are not going to be able to solder or manipulate anything inside there and have a positive result. If you have a busted CPU and you want to see how it's put together, you want to open it up and just kind of see how the manufacturer puts things together. Cool. Give it a shot. Just understand once you do that, it's likely never going to work again. So bear that in mind. So if you're having intermittent or random issues, <clears throat> it likely would be associated with overheating. So make sure your heat sink is properly applied. The uh, motherboard may not be applying it a constant flow of power. That's another issue. Power issues are extremely difficult to diagnose as an IT tech. Um, so like if you like, we're going to do it with power supplies, intermittent power supply issues, like a failing Power supply is one of the more difficult things to diagnose because it will seem like different aspects of the computer are failing at different times and it's not always happening. It's happening on occasion. So they can be very, very frustrating to diagnose. So kind of one of those things when all else fails, if you don't have a um, power supply tester, try swapping out the power, power supply itself and see if that corrects the issue. So. Catastrophic issues cause the system not to boot at all. You'll get a series of beeps, post error. Listen to the beeps you get. You know, I got three short beeps and a long beep. Look it up based off of the motherboard manufacturer and it'll tell you where the issue is occurring. <clears throat> Looking up that code would be kind of your first step in diagnosing the problem. All right. And with that, we should now be able to describe the various types of processors and articulate how to select a processor to match system needs. Hint, hint look at the paperwork. Next, identify the CPU as a, as a central processing unit and explain its purpose and the requirements to keep it functioning. Choose appropriate cooling methods, name the steps to replacing and installing a processor, um, identify common pitfalls and how to troubleshoot them. Any questions, comments, concerns? I have a question. Could you 